Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today to discuss the wonderful world of programmatic advertising. I'm here with you, Jackie, as a director of digital strategy with Chatterblast Media. And who else I have on the call with me today is Joe Minio, who is our ads and analytics manager and wizard. <laughs> Uh, at CBM, we've been tracking the usage of programmatic ads over the last 12 months and seeing more and more brands using these and taking advantage with great success. What we've concluded is that by the end of 2019, most of our clients are going to be using this form of advertising to work within behavioral targeting with at least one of their digital campaigns, if not more, moving forward. Um, throughout the campaigns and throughout this presentation, we're excited to share what our findings of knowledge have been uh, from our in-house expert, Joe, who has been spearheading the initiative here at Chatterblast Media. We hope that you leave the presentation with new ideas and questions for your own marketing strategies. And as always, we're happy uh, to help you navigate the wild west of digital. So with that, I leave you with Joe. Hi, everybody. So we're all here to learn about programmatic. It's a fancy word for not such a fancy task. Programmatic is simply just a method of advertising that uses software or a program to purchase digital ads through an ad exchange. Everyone here has experienced them in some shape or form. So let's run through a few of the examples you may have encountered. Here we have a traditional display ad. These are the little banners that pop up and are usually just trying to get you to click on them. Native or sponsored content ads appear mostly on news or blog sites as they're designed to look like all the other content on the page. You can find them on the left or right rails or embedded within an article with a phrase like more stories you may like or content from our sponsors, you know, super straightforward stuff. Retargeting banners are next and these are the creepy little banners that follow you around based on your shopping or browsing habits. Raise your hand if you've ever been personally victimized by retargeting banner ads. I know I have, especially when it's a product I really want. <laughs> nice, Kendra. Next up, we have video pre-roll ads. These show up before video content across the web and have even creeped into Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And they're a really great way to get some brand awareness into your digital campaigns. Next up, mobile banner ads. These are the tiny little banners on your phone that are usually sticking to the top or bottom of a page. If you tap these and they open up to larger ads, those are called rich media banners or expandable banners. And they can include everything from weather updates to store locators and even form fills. These skinny mobile banners are one of the most effective mobile ad placements and traditionally get the highest click-through rates. Next up, we have social ads. And these are the ads you see on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Each platform has their own audience network, which is a fancy way of saying that they serve social ads to people programmatically on other websites, just like the ads we just went through. These are among the cheapest and most efficient ads, mainly because the amount of data that each site, like Instagram or Facebook, collects on its users. So they don't have to rely on third-party targeting, which always deals with another person and another company and requires spending a lot more money to serve those ads. And lastly, we have connected TV and over the top ads. And these are served through video content apps like Hulu, Sling TV, and Watch ESPN. And they can be targeted on devices like your, fi your Amazon Fire Stick or your Roku TV. So how does it all work? How do we serve these ads and what makes them programmatic? The first way is real-time bidding. If you visit a website, you might notice that your article or website loads way faster than the ads. And that's because within that time, thousands or millions of auctions are taking place in those extra seconds. The winner of the auction is paying money to get your eyeballs on their ad. And that money is going back to the website or publisher. Here's a simple flow chart to show you how it all takes place. First, the client or agency tells their demand side platform or DSP how much they're willing to pay for a certain amount of impressions based on specific criteria like demographics or location. Next, the DSP enters an auction, which is run by a supply side platform or an SSP. The SSP then serves the ads and gives the money back to the publisher. Why does this happen? Well, publishers have millions of available impressions, but they don't have an easy way to sell all of it off. By not selling, they're losing hundreds or thousands of dollars each day, especially if they're a really popular website. 
by auctioning off the space, someone's paying something, and that's a lot better than nothing. From a client or agency side, you're often getting impressions much cheaper since the inventory isn't limited to specific publishers or categories of content. If you're worried about where your ads will end up, most DSPs offer blacklisting services to ensure your ads won't next, end up next to extreme or sensitive content. The other way ads are served programmatically is through direct buying, also known as dynamic ad insertion. If I'm a publisher and I'm collecting data on the users of my website, I can use that data to sell my impressions directly to DSPs, clients, or agencies. This is another great way to protect brands as publishers can ensure that clients' ads won't show up next to extreme or sensitive content. And here's another helpful flowchart to explain this process. It's a little bit different. First, the client or agency contacts their DSP, who then goes directly to the publisher to work out a deal. Clients and agencies can typically go directly to publishers as well, but when you're doing it at scale, it's easier to work through a demand side platform. From there, a publisher directly inserts the ads through their program server, which then gives each user a unique ad experience based on their demographic or geographic profile. Why does this happen? Where real-time bidding is cheap and efficient, a lot of businesses want to get the most bang out of their product. So they'll typically go direct and try to get a higher spend out of their advertisers. It usually requires a sales team and a lot of patience. So most publishers work with a combination of both methods to ensure that impressions aren't wasted and money is always flowing in, whether it's you know, a big amount or a small amount. So to recap, why go programmatic? Glorious efficiency. Real-time bidding is making sure that every piece of inventory is filled for publishers and advertisers have access to lots of inventory without the hassle of a lengthy sales process. Direct buying, on the other hand, gives publishers incentive to sell their, to sell their unique content with a markup and it allows advertisers a safe place to put their ads without having to apply blacklists. Another great reason for advertising programmatically is the huge amount of data that advertisers can collect. From keyword and creative performance to location and conversion data, the information can help guide and explore new marketing decisions and ultimately provide new opportunities for businesses. Something worth noting is that digital isn't the enemy of traditional advertising. Digital marketing is just a piece of the pie, playing nicely with every aspect of a, of a client's campaigns and goals. Digital helps attribute, lead to stronger traditional performance, increases brand awareness, and best of all, helps businesses make sales. Now that we've covered the basics, let's dive into some key terms and stats to help show how programmatic can tie it all together. Walled garden sites are websites, services, or companies that collect first party data and have some sort of direct ad buying method to serve ads to those users. Think of most social sites like Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and then think of massive companies like Google. Connected TV, or CTV, is a device that allows for live TV as well as over-the-top or OTT apps and services. Two-thirds of U.S. households own a connected TV, so there's a good chance you might have one at home that you can check out later. Over-the-top, or OTT, is an app or subscription service that provides streaming video content and bypasses traditional distribution. The term over-the-top refers to a fancy chart that was displayed on IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau's website, that shows how these systems and distribution apps go over the top of cable and satellite providers. However, most cable and satellite providers now have their own OTT apps to combat cord cutting and people cutting out that service. And this has opened the door to all sorts of advertising inventory, which is awesome news for clients and agencies. Here we can see the impact of digital based on Nielsen's Q2 total audience report. The average person spends 41% of their day interacting with some sort of digital media and over 55 minutes on a walled garden platform. When it comes to multi-device usage, 73% of adults use a device like a smartphone or a tablet while watching TV and 59% of adults say they're more receptive of digital ads while watching TV. This is great news for both TV advertisers and digital advertisers, as cross-channel programmatic campaigns can be highly effective at reaching key audiences. If you're thinking only millennials and younger people are streaming TV, 
take a step back and look at this chart. Yes, it's skewed younger, but 43% of people 65 and older are streaming at home. Not to mention 60% of US households own a connected TV device. And in a city like Philadelphia, that's over 4 million homes available for custom, targeted, relevant programmatic ad campaigns. Those are just a sampling of the statistics for digital. And again, it's important to note that although digital share is increasing, it doesn't mean value is diminished for other mediums. If anything, digital is enhancing the experience. And for now, let's shift over to tactics, like how can I reach my audience through programmatic? Let's start with the most basic form, demographic targeting. Simply pick things like gender, age, and specifics like household income to set up your campaign. For example, if a pretzel company wanted to grow sales with adults 18 to 34, they could simply set up a campaign for adults 18 to 34 who have purchased pretzel-related products in the past 30 days. Now, you're probably wondering, how can you get that specific? Well, credit card companies often sell their purchase data to data companies who then turn around and sell anonymous audiences to advertisers, like people who have purchased pretzel-related products. Creepy? Yes. Illegal? Not at all. Just like Facebook and Twitter, credit card companies have terms and conditions that you must agree to before using their products. The good thing is that they anonymize the data, which means that they don't know who you are. They just know that you like pretzels because you bought pretzels with your credit card. I can do a whole webinar on that, but let's move on to another creepy tactic, geofencing. You can serve ads to zip codes, counties, states, countries, or even specific buildings or streets. If you have location services turned on with an app on your phone, that app is collecting data, location data specifically, to serve you ads for connected TVs. You know, it's using your Wi-Fi server location data, or sometimes the location of the initial Wi-Fi connection, depending on what the settings are. There's a million ways to collect location data. And if you're using a mobile phone or some type of digital device, there's a good chance that they know where you are, as horrible as it sounds. A great example of geofencing for our purposes is for a retail complex that's trying to increase foot traffic. They could target Rittenhouse Square, which if you're not in Philadelphia, it's a busy shopping district here, and they can get as many people as they want by just fencing off specific stores that match brands that are similar. And by doing this, all of those people walking around are available for impressions. They can serve those impressions and not have to worry about inventory issues or scale issues if they wanted to increase their spend. It's an excellent tactic for digital advertising. So let's get back to retargeting, since that's kind of come up a couple times, and technically it's been retargeting throughout this campaign presentation. How do they stalk you for what feels like a lifetime, and how does this happen on the user's end? So let's start with a real life example. I was surfing around looking for a good tax service, because since tax day is right around the corner, I'm looking for something to file my taxes with. I visited H&R Block's website to get an idea of what they had to offer, and I left without taking any actions like booking a call or an appointment. Afterwards, I was served ads on my phone, and even later when I went to BuzzFeed. H&R Block knows what I want, and they want me to know that they're the best choice for their tax products, so they just keep serving me retargeting ads. How does it work on the advertiser's end? Well, an advertiser just has to place a piece of code on their website called a pixel, and that pixel captures data on users as long as it's in place. And then the ad server can then use that data to retarget users who have visited the website within a specific time frame, typically 15 to 30 days. You can lower that time frame to make sure that the people are more relevant, but if you're still seeing ads 30 days on and you've already taken an action, sometimes that can you know, decrease the quality of the experience. So typically, advertisers tend to shrink that window down. As far as tactics go, you can retarget with your website. You can retarget by serving ads to people who have searched for specific keywords or terms. You can retarget using an email list or a CRM database list, or even retarget people on social who have visited your Facebook or Instagram page. The goal of retargeting is to reach people who have shown intent, and these ads can really help bolster brand awareness and conversions. Another method of targeting is by device or operating system. This is helpful for companies that have apps designed for specific devices, like in this example. Why serve to Apple users if Apple users can't access your product? 
An interesting fact not included here is that only 44% of people in the US are using Apple smartphones. That's less than half. So this example isn't so far from possible. The final tactic we'll go over is conquest targeting. We can serve ads to people visiting competitors because the internet is the wild west and anything goes. A perfect example of this is Burger King's brilliant ad conquesting of McDonald's back in December. Want a Whopper for a penny? Download the Burger King app and drive to a McDonald's. From there, you'll get a coupon and directions to the near nearest Burger King. It's not ideal because obviously you have to drive to McDonald's and then drive back to Burger King, but the whole point is people are willing to drive if they're gonna get that Whopper for a penny. All they had to do on Burger King's end was geofence McDonald's locations and let the news travel. The PR agencies took everything else and it exploded across the internet. There are dozens of applications and methods for conquest targeting, and if you're really creative, you can do so much with it. And there's a good chance that your competitors are already doing it to you, and they're doing it in some way, shape, or form that can be affecting your business. So you know the basics, you know how it works, and you know how you're gonna run some campaigns, but how does it perform in real life? Well, this winter, a shopping mall group wanted to reach people interested in holiday shopping events, as you may have seen throughout this presentation. We set up a demographic audience for them and geofenced several large areas around each mall, targeting ads specifically to connected TVs, delivering ads through OTT apps and services. Overall, the mall's website saw a lift in organic and direct search and saw an increase in mall foot traffic as the campaign went on. We were able to identify new audience opportunities for the shopping mall. From the location data that we were able to gather, we could see the distribution of impressions throughout the tri-state area, seeing that a specific group of zip codes in South Jersey received a heavy dose of impressions. This showed us that we could hone in on these for future mobile campaigns, and it also gave us a good idea of where the foot traffic was actually coming from. From the hourly data, we're able to see a strong trend in where the impressions were distributed. Take note on the zero that represents midnight all the way on the right side, and then the eight for 8 a.m. all the way on the left side. This showed us that a lot of people were served ads in the early morning hours, which can sometimes catch people off guard. A lot of advertisers think that people are only awake and interacting with mediums from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. or even 10 p.m. if you're working with primetime TV. Since a connected TV will only serve ads if you're active on the platform, this data shows us that well over 200,000 impressions were seen when people were active overnight. May some people be asleep in front of a TV? Yes, but it's just like people passively listening to the radio or passively you know, cooking and watching TV or swiping quickly through Facebook, not even paying attention, if you wanna call it that. This data isn't to alarm anyone, it's merely to show a time-shifted trend. And if people aren't paying attention, it would be a few impressions here or there. It wouldn't be such a grand scale of impressions. This isn't, you know, crazy and out of the ordinary. Um, it actually showed the shopping mall that they pointed out that a few of their locations were near military bases. So it was interesting to see that the military base behavior was reflected in this data. And when they came back to us and said that, we're like, wow, that really, you know, shows us something interesting from just looking at the hours from the impressions served. Moving along to a, program, a programmatic mobile campaign case study, a high-end boarding school wanted to reach prospective students' parents. We pulled together a keyword list for search retargeting and served ads to people searching those terms for up to 30 days. At the end of the campaign, we were able to see a direct correlation between con conversion actions and applications received by the school in the last 100 days. From the Google Analytics data we gathered, when the campaign finally wrapped, not only could we see the impact of our ad campaign, but we were able to see a massive jump in organic search traffic. It's worth noting that this client wasn't doing any other advertising or branding outside of our efforts. So the only attributable difference to the organic search traffic is the programmatic campaign. Our last case study deals with a health spa that wanted to get people to buy gift cards. They gave us a massive email list which we then combined with social ads to retarget high intent users within the last 35 days leading up to the holidays. At the end, we saw a massive boost to website traffic with intent to purchase, as well as a 47% uptick in organic search traffic compared to the previous year. Through creative audience and tactic testing, 
we were also able to identify new segments and inform new opportunities for the spa. So how can you get started using programmatic ads today? Here are a few things to think about. What are some key initiatives or events coming up for your business? Have you explored new audiences or creative campaigns related to your business? Will you need design work or do you need to employ someone for creative services to get your ads to pop on digital and convey your message in the perfect way? What does your budget look like for marketing? Programmatic can be much less expensive than some mediums, but it all depends on how you're measuring your ROI. Have you been able to measure the success of previous campaigns? Yes, TV and radio have various you know, forms of measurement tools, but have you ever been able to see the data behind everything that can show you the value and return on your marketing spend? I know that's a lot of information to soak in, but rest assured we're here for you if you wanna get some more clarity or revisit this presentation. Thanks for taking us through all that, Joe. I know that was a lot, but I'm hoping that most people are coming off lunch so they have a little you know, extra energy in the tank. <laughs> um, we do welcome all questions. There is a Q&A tab at the very bottom of the screen. So if anyone does have any questions they want to shoot over, we're happy to chat through those in the next few minutes that we have left. Um, but going uh, on with Chatterblast itself, you know, that we serve as a vertically integrated solution. And what that means is we're creating, we're placing, we're monitoring, analyzing all the results and everything that has to do with these programmatic ads. So it does it combine all of the above. Again, the programmatic ad space certainly isn't a two minute conversation and can go on for some time. So I want to remind everyone that joined us today that if this does feel, you know, a little scratch of the head that we're here for you and we're happy to chat directly with anyone. Um, so again, I will give you five minutes back to your day, but thank you all for joining us.